Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I am uh, Professor Ma'moon Ahram. Um, I'll start with you uh, with this course Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, and uh, I'll be doing this with uh, two of my colleagues, Dr. Nafid Abtarbush and Dr. Diala Abu Hassan. So what we will do is that we will start with six lectures on molecular techniques. I'll do that. Uh, then Dr. Diala will uh, start with you uh, doing introduction into biochemistry and uh, five lectures on acids, bases, pH, and buffers. I'll come back and I'll give you six lectures on carbohydrates and lipids and I'll be done. Then Dr. Diala will start again. Um, you know, sorry for the mix-up, but this is a good organization of the course, I think. Uh, she will start with amino acids, then she will cover uh, proteins and protein structures, and we will. she will do three lectures linking protein structure to function. I think that these are really exciting lectures because here um, we, we link uh, certain structures like to, to function. Like, for example, why is it that a certain amino acid exists in this exact position? Uh, why is it that this protein has this particular structure okay so i think that these are relevant and exciting lectures um, dr diana will be done and then dr uh, nafid will uh, start um, and continue the course till the end uh, she, he will cover enzymes um, different lectures on enzymes and he will end up with uh, biochemical techniques so i think that these lectures are really good um you will enjoy him i hope and i think that you're lucky that you'll be studying biochemistry this summer okay so let me start with recombinant dna based molecular techniques so what i've done here is that um, i've divided the lectures or the topics into uh, well i've covered the lectures into two topics uh, the first three lectures, I'll be talking about recombinant DNA-based molecular techniques. And then the second topic will be covered in three lectures. Um, we'll be talking about enzyme-based molecular techniques. So let's start with restriction endonucleases. We talked about restriction endonucleases before. And we said that nucleases are enzymes that cleave nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Specifically, you have uh, endonucleases, which are enzymes that, that um, cut DNA in the middle of the molecule. Okay, This is versus exonucleases, EXO nucleases, which degrade, cleave uh, the uh, nucleotides of DNA from either end. So you have these endonucleases. Specifically, we're going to talk about restriction endonucleases, which are enzymes, bacterial enzymes, that degrade DNA in the middle at specific positions. Okay. So what they do is that they recognize a specific sequence called a restriction site, and usually it is about four to eight nucleotides long or base pair long. And they cut within these sites, resulting in the formation of restriction fragments. Okay, so right here you have a DNA, you have a restriction in the nucleus, it recognizes a restriction site, uh, CCC, GGG specifically, and this enzyme would then cut the DNA within the restriction site, resulting in the formation of restriction fragments. So, what they do is that they cut phosphodiester bonds. Okay. Notice something. That these sequences can be read from 5' prime to 3' prime on both strands the same exact thing. So echo R1, that's one type of a restriction in the nucleus, very famous. We talked about it before and said that echo R1 recognizes the sequence G A A T T C. Now if you look at the opposite complementary strand, Notice that the sequence is exactly the same, G, A, A, T, T, C. 
Again, we are reading from 5 prime to 3 prime. Look at another uh, endonuclease, Hindi 3. It's called Hindi 3. A A G C T T. The opposite complementary strand, A A G C T T. Same exact thing. Here's another one, small 1, C C C G G G. The same thing is read from 5 prime to 3 prime on the complementary strand. Now, these sequences are known as palindromic sequences. Palindromic sequences, that is, sequences that are read from either uh, on either strand, the same exact thing. Okay, so what happens here is that these endonucleases would make two types of cuts depending on where the cuts are. One cut is known as a blunt cut, resulting in the formation of blunt ended fragments. The meaning of blunt is that it's uh, sharp, okay? Um, it's, it's a cut that goes straight from um, up to bottom, okay? So for example, you can have a cut that goes like this, like a knife, okay? So um, straight cut, resulting in blunt ended fragments, that is, there are, uh, the, the ends are smooth. This is in contrast to what is known as staggered cuts. What staggered cuts uh, mean is that you have a cut like between G and A right here on that strand and on the other strand the cut occurs between G and A resulting in the formation of what is known as sticky ends or cohesive ends. Okay, The reason is that uh, the, the reason why they're called this sticky ends is that this end is complementary to this end. So these two ends can form hydrogen bonds between each other, except that it is not stable. Why? Because there is no phosphodiester bond between this nucleotide and that nucleotide. Okay. So that's the meaning of sticky ended DNA fragments. Well, here's another look at it, uh, a cut between G and A resulting in the formation of two restriction fragments with sticky ends. So eventually this end can form hydrogen bonds with this end, except again that there is no phosphodiester bond. Okay. Now, we can form a phosphodiester bond between the G and the A by, a, by an enzyme known as a DNA ligase. Now the action here is known as ligation. It's like gluing the two strands with each other or the two fragments with each other. Okay? And the enzyme is known as a DNA ligase. Okay. So that's what a DNA ligase does. It comes in, it forms a, a phosphodiester bond between the five prime end of this fragment with the three prime end of that fragment. Notice the uh, cohesive ends right here. Okay, so you can have the formation of hydrogen bonds followed by a phosphodiester bond formation between the two fragments. Now you have a DNA fragment that is uh, linked, one continuous DNA fragment, and the ends are stable. Okay, remember that this enzyme requires ATP, it needs energy. Okay, so that's restriction endonucleases. Now, in the previous course, uh, we talked about restriction endonucleases and how we can use these enzymes in RFLP, or restriction fragment length polymorphism, how we can differentiate samples from each other, or we can, we can link samples to individuals because each individual has his or her own molecular profile, okay? because of these differences in DNA sequences. So we talked about RFLP before and how we can determine paternity or we can use it in forensic medicine, uh, crime scene investigation and so on, remember that? Okay, so another use of restriction in the nucleases is what is known as cloning, okay? 
what cloning means is that you can make several copies of one thing. So if I say I want to clone a DNA, it means that I want to make multiple copies of this DNA fragment. If I say human cloning, it means that I'm making many copies of an individual. So that's what cloning means. Okay. Now, the thing is, cloning is really uh, something natural in bacteria because you can have a bacterial cell that is grown on a plate. You will study this in microbiology. It's called a petri dish. You can have this one single um, bacterial cell that eventually after a few hours or let's say 24 hours, it will form a colony. Now, each colony is really a clone of each particular cell. Okay, so the, these cells are all identical because they have the same uh, DNA sequence or the same molecular profile. Okay, so this is what DNA cloning or bacteria cloning means. So DNA cloning is making copies of the same DNA. Well, how can we do that with uh, DNA? How can we do DNA cloning? Well, the thing is, in order to do that, we need what is known as a vector. A vector is a carrier. Okay. So the idea here is that it's a, it's a carrier of the DNA fragment that we want to clone, that we want to make copies of. Okay. Now, what we do is that we use a vector, a carrier, and this carrier is usually, or what commonly, it's a DNA plasmid. A plasmid is basically an extra chromosomal DNA. What it means is that it's a DNA that is different than the bacterial chromosome. Remember, bacteria, bacterial cells have one chromosome, one circular chromosome, but they can also have multiple copies of, uh, of plasmids, which are extra chromosomal. Okay, DNA pieces. That is, they can replicate independent of the chromosome, of the bacterial chromosome or the, the chromosomal genome itself. Okay, so a bacterial cell may have uh, multiple plasmids. Okay, so a plasmid is a circular DNA. It's a small DNA that contains some genes and these genes give advantage to these bacterial cells. Okay. Now, we take a plasmid and we insert the DNA fragment inside the plasmid. Now, so we have a DNA molecule having two different independent uh, uh, pieces of DNA integrated or ligated to each other. This is known as a recombinant DNA molecule. So a recombinant DNA molecule is basically a DNA molecule that is made of two different DNA fragments linked or ligated to each other. Now, the reason why I do this is that when I insert a DNA fragment like, th like this one here, the, the plasmid is inserted into bacteria and bacterial cells would make multiple copies of the same plasmid. So basically, we let bacteria clone the DNA, the recombinant DNA molecule. So instead of having, uh, so if I insert it into a bacterial cell and this bacterial cell would make millions of other bacteri bacterial cells, I'm, I'm making not only millions, but multiple millions of, these, uh, of, the, of the plasmids because each bacterial cell would make uh, multiple copies of the same plasmid, okay? So hopefully it, uh, this will be clarified uh, later on. So, so we use plasmids as vectors, as carriers. Okay. So bacteria cell would have one chromosome, but they can have multiple plasmids. Well, how can we make a recombinant DNA molecule? Well, we have to choose the right plasmid, and the right plasmid would have uh, must have multiple features. First of all, they have to replicate, and they have to replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. 
so they can make multiple copies of themselves. That's one. Number two, uh, so in order to replicate, they have to have an origin of replication. Remember this, this is the site, a sequence that allows a plasmid or a chromosome to uh, uh, chromosome replication to be initiated. So it's the starting point is as at the origin of replication. Another feature of the plasmid is that it must have a place whereby I can insert the foreign DNA. It must have a place where I can make a cut, insert the DNA fragment, and then close it. So now the foreign DNA would be part of the vector, would be part of the DNA, okay? And creating a recombinant DNA. And by the way, the whole thing is known as recombinant DNA technology that is manipulating DNA. Okay. Now, another feature that is important for plasmids to have is that they have to be selected or they can be selected. What do we mean by that? It means that if I insert, if a bacterial cell has a plasmid, I must select it versus bacterial cells that do not have plasmids okay so this is known as a selectable marker and usually it is what is known as an antibiotic resistance gene okay or a drug resistance gene so that bacteria so if a bacterial cell has a plasmid they must have this feature of being resistant to the antibiotic so that they do not die they do not get killed by the antibiotic Okay, here's the thing. That's how we create a recombinant DNA. The idea here is that um, I take a, a piece of DNA from human cell. Okay, I make a cut of the this DNA by echo R1, the restriction endonuclease that recognizes G A A T T C sequence and it makes a cut between G and A. Okay. Now I take a plasmid from bacteria and I cut it with the same exact restriction endonucleus, echo R1. Remember here, since we're talking about the same endonuclease, the ends, the cohesive ends would be exactly the same. And they are complementary to each other. Meaning that if I combine this DNA fragment with the plasmid DNA, eventually what would happen is that the ends would, would bind, would form hydrogen bonds to each other, right? Because they are complementary to each other. So you can have this plasmid DNA containing the DNA fragment of interest, the human DNA. Now, then I add a DNA ligase and the ligase makes a phosphodiester bond, covalent bond, making or creating a stable plasmid vector or recombinant DNA. I take this plasmid and I put it back into the bacteria, bacterial cells. Okay, so the bacterial cell would have its own chromosome as well as the recombinant DNA, the plasmid with the human gene. Okay. When I do this, now, back to, and I add an antibiotic to the media as well. Uh, that is, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I grow the bacterial cells, I add an antibiotic. Why? In order to select for the bacterial cells that have a plasmid. So bacterial cells that do not have a plasmid would die because of the antibiotic. They cannot replicate anymore. They cannot grow anymore. But bacterial cells that have the plasmid, they are resistant. They have the gene that makes them resistant to the antibiotic. Actually, what will happen is that these cells would grow. They not only would amplify their own chromosome, of course, because they grow, they can also make multiple copies of the same plasmid. So bacterial cells would have at least one plasmid and they can have multiple plasmids as well. 
So you can imagine that if I start with one bacterial cell having one plasmid, eventually after 24 hours, let's say, I'm going to have millions of bacterial cells because they grow really fast. And each one of them, if we assume that each one of them would have five plasmids, we're talking about five million copies of the same exact plasmid. And that's how we cloned DNA. Okay. Now, we can take advantage of plasmids by not only cloning the DNA fragment of interest, but we can also make bacteria express a gene. That is, in other words, making RNA, which can then be by transcription, which can be translated into a protein. So I can make bacteria express or produce a human protein. And this actually has been used a lot in medicine because now we, we allow bacteria to make insulin. And this has solved huge problem for people with diabetes. We can produce growth hormones. We can uh, produce plasminogen activator, which is used in uh, blood clotting, as well as erythropoietin. We you will study all of these later on. Okay, so the idea here is that we use what is known as an expression vector. So this expression vector, in addition to one, the origin of replication, that's one. Two, the antibiotic resistance gene. Three, a place we, where we can clone the DNA, uh, a place where we can cut the plasmid and insert the DNA fragment of interest. We need other sequences as well in order to make bacteria produce a protein. What do we need? We need a promoter. So what is a promoter? It is the region where the RNA polymerase binds to in order to start transcription. So we need a promoter and this promoter must be upstream of the gene. Remember what an upstream is? It means it, it's before the gene. So right here, okay, we have a cloning site, but we have, let's uh, zoom in to this. Okay, so they, they back, these two bacterial cells have exactly the same protein according to size, for example, you can see the difference, but they also have, but these cells have the, they, they express the protein of interest. Okay, so these are expression vectors. This is how we can take advantage of cloning. Now, except that there are challenges when it comes to producing human proteins in bacteria. One of them is that human proteins, some human proteins have disulfide bonds. They have these these connections between the amino acids, specifically cysteine, and we will talk about this uh, in, in the protein structure lectures. Bacterial cells cannot do disulfide bonds. They do not do this linkage. They do not have the enzymes necessary for the formation of disulfide bonds. Something else is that proteins in human cells can be modified by, for example, glycosylation that is the addition of sugars to proteins so some human proteins are known as glycoproteins because they have sugars attached to them this does not exist in bacterial cells so glycosylated proteins cannot be produced in bacteria or they would not be stable or they would not be um, uh, functional because they are lacking uh, the, the sugar proteins. Something else is that folding, that is formation of a, a, a structure, a, a protein with its own functional structure may not happen in bacteria because we have in, in human cells, proteins can be folded or protein structure can be determined by other proteins. Okay. So we may produce a protein, yes, but it would not be a functional protein with its own functional structure. Now, the other thing is that 
bacteria may recognize that this protein is foreign. It's not right. It's not a bacterial protein, so they would degrade it. So these are some challenges when it comes to producing uh, human proteins in bacteria. So as a result, some people use yeast, khamira. Why? Because yeast is a eukaryotic system. It follows the rules of uh, uh, human cells. Not only that, but the advantage of yeast is that they are single cells. They grow and behave like bacteria. So they have a eukaryotic machinery, molecular machinery, and at the same time, they grow really fast and they are easy to work with and easy to manipulate. Okay. Now, another advantage of using um, of using uh, cloning of a human gene into plasmids is that we can do what is known as protein tagging. Okay. So, what is protein tagging? Well, basically, it's it's uh, remember you you know you have a T-shirt having a tag attached to it so it's something that's attached to a molecule okay that's to a protein molecule so this is a tag which can be removed as well okay so protein tagging okay addition or addition of a, a certain sequence to a protein okay so how we do how do we do this well we do it using expression vectors but they are modified they're modified in a way whereby the, the sequence, an additional sequence, is added to the plasmid. This is the tag. Okay, so when we clone, we, when we insert a DNA fragment into, uh, into a plasmid, part of the sequence of this DNA would be the sequence that I've added, the, the tagging sequence right here. Okay, so so the idea is that when I produce, when I do transcription and translation, or when bacteria cells do transcription and translation, the protein that is produced would have the tag attached to it, this additional sequence attached to it. It would be part of it. Okay, so now my protein is tagged. Okay, so what's the importance of tagging? What do I use it for? Well, I can use it for uh, many, uh, there are many applications. One of them is that I can detect it. Okay, we'll talk about these techniques later on. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you about these techniques um, in these lectures. Uh, we can use the tags to uh, purify the proteins. Okay, so we're gonna skip these, um, the, this part. Now, there are different tags that we can use. We can use a small tag, which is basically six histidines. Histidines are amino acids. So the protein would have six histidines attached to the protein. Or we can even tag it with a large protein as well. So he, in this case, we would have two proteins linked to each other, the protein of interest as well as another protein, and this is a specific protein. It, it can be a protein known as green fluorescent protein, or it can be an enzyme like a glutathione S transferase. Okay, so here, um, let's, here we have a protein with a his tag. Okay, here we have a protein having six histidines attached to it. The importance of these six histidines is that they can bind to a metal known as nickel. So the idea here is that I can use uh, this property of the protein, uh, in, uh, that is the ability to bind nickel, to isolate from all of the other proteins that do not bind to nickel. So right here, I have bacterial cells, all the proteins in bacterial cells, separated by gel electrophoresis, and this is the protein that these cells express. Notice the amount of proteins. Okay, so they produce a lot of this protein. 
Here, after I do purification here, I'm isolating the proteins that bind to nickel, and there is only one protein that does that, which is my protein having the six histidines. Now, no bacterial proteins uh, has six histidines, so there's only one, which is the recombinant protein. Now, this is something else. This is a protein having the glutathione S transferase. I can also do the same thing here. I have my, my protein right here, and I can use this recombinant protein or the, uh, the glutathione S transferase. I can take advantage of it in purifying the protein of interest. So that is this recombinant protein. So how can I how can I integrate? How can I produce one protein large protein having two proteins? Well, here we have. How can I do this? Well, here you have gene A and gene B. And let's say that gene A is the uh, protein, the known protein, and this is the protein that I want to uh, that I want to study further. Well, what I can do is that I can put these genes together, one next to the other. So when they are produced into a, a, a into when, when they are transcribed and translated, I'm going to produce one large protein having both of them linked to each other. This is known as genetic engineering. Okay, genetic engineering. So now the thing is. I can I can even do further manipulations by the way. Let's say that this is gene A and it produces a protein with two particular domains or structures and each domain has a certain function. So for example, this part of the protein binds to DNA and this part has an enzymatic activity. Okay? Let's say and and this is the same thing with gene B. Well, I can do genetic engineering, taking this part of the gene to produce this domain, okay? And I can take this part of the gene, which produces particularly, specifically this domain, I, I can put them all together, producing one protein having two different domains to each other. So this would be able, it would function exactly like this domain right here, and this yellow, part of the protein would function exactly like this domain right here. So this is another way of doing, uh, of, of creating recombinant proteins. Okay, taking advantage of domains. And we will define domains uh, later on in this course as well. So the thing is, right here, you have a recombinant protein, a protein that is made of uh, one part of it is what is known as the green fluorescent protein. And this is another different protein that I want to study further. Now, this protein has a characteristic having a green fluorescent protein. What's a green fluorescent protein? It's a protein that was isolated from jellyfish. And these, these uh, creatures can fluoresce. They can produce light. Okay, so scientists uh, found out why they fluoresce, why they produce this light, and they isolated the gene, and the gene produces a green fluorescent protein, okay, a protein that fluoresces. So when we create this recombinant protein, having a green fluorescent protein attached to it, my protein of interest now can fluoresce, okay, why? Because this has, the protein of interest, has a domain that is uh, separate, independent of the domain of the green fluorescent protein. Now, the functions are maintained. So the green fluorescent protein can still fluoresce, and this protein can still be functional as well. Okay? That's the power of domains. They are independent of each other. So here... These are uh, different proteins that fluoresce by creating these recombinant proteins. That's a whole cell, for example. Everything fluoresces, uh, whatever the protein is. Here you have actin, the actin protein. Remember, it creates the actin cytoskeleton. Um, you can see how 
the actin filaments can fluoresce because each actin protein has a green fluorescent protein attached to it. Here we have uh, cells with mitochondrial protein um, attached to green fluorescent protein. This is the tubular protein and so on. Here you have different creatures that fluoresce. Here you have the worm, a worm known as C. elegans. Here you have a fly, Drosophila fly. Here you have mice that can fluoresce. A whole rabbit can fluoresce and so on. So you can do wonders um, with the green fluorescent protein. These are neurons, for example. You can see how they are connected to each other uh, very clearly. So this is the power of the green fluorescent uh, protein.